Let us pray together. Our God, when we cast our nets trying to fish and get nothing, we may feel that our cries to you are not heard, but you call us to persevere and we find abundance in places that surprise and excite us. You let us be successful when we fish in empty waters and you equip us together as we search the deep for souls to bring to you. Thank you, God, for your provision. Amen. And now, as the people of faith, let us uh, affirm our faith before God and one another using that historic confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have been listening to the prayers of your people. We are bold to approach the throne of grace, not due to worthiness, but to uh, your welcome through Jesus Christ. We pray for those named and for those whom we name in our hearts, uh, for healing grace to come upon them, uh, for comfort in times of sorrow and grief, uh, for joy in celebrations and accomplishments for safety for our servicemen and women around this world. Uh, We pray, dear Lord, that you will touch your church, not just here, but around the world. Make us agents of your will and purpose, of your love and peace. Uh, We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite all of the children to come forward and for all God's children to give ear to Miss Carol Sutherland as she shares with us our scripture of the day. Come on down, kids. Hold up. Well, you'll be glad to know that there were probably 40 children at this point in the rise this morning. So we're not bereft of children. Do you know what a disciple is? Can you name a disciple? Well, a disciple is a follower and a helper. 
And you know Jesus had some followers and helpers that were very special to him. And we wonder sometimes, how did that happen? How did they get so close to him? Well, there's a wonderful story in Luke that tells us how Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John became his disciples. And I want to share that story with you. Well, Jesus was at Capernaum, which is a little seaside town, very much like Moorhead City, where there were lots of fishermen. And he was preaching and decided he'd go out of town to the edge of the Sea of Galilee. Well, he had crowds with him. And he thought, I can't, some of those way back can't see me and maybe they can't hear me. And he saw Peter and Andrew and James and John folding up their nets at their boats. And he walked over and he said, I'm going to get in your boat and row out a little bit so that I can speak to the people and they'll be able to hear and see. So Jesus did that and he did his sermon. And then the people started to go home. And he looked at Peter and he said, Peter, throw your nets over. Let's go out a little deeper. Throw your nets over to fish. Simon Peter said, Master, we have been fishing all night and we haven't caught a single fish. Jesus said, let's go a little deeper and throw your nets in the water. So they dutifully obeyed, thinking there were no fish. Well, you know what happened? What do you think they happened when they pulled their nets up? Did they? They had fish. They had lots of fish. They had so many fish that they told James and John to come over and look at it and help them pull these fish in. They were amazed. In fact, Peter was so amazed that he fell down on his knees. And he said, Jesus, I'm not worthy of this. But you know what Jesus told him? He said, fear not, but follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, does that mean we're going to throw out a line and catch people with it? No. What would fishers of men be? That we're going to fish. We are going to fish, but we're going to fish in a way that Jesus did and show people how wonderful it is when you obey, like Simon did, when you obey Jesus' command. And that's what we'll be as fishers of men, showing others what wonders can be made, and we will win them over. And after that day, Peter and Andrew and James and John stayed with Jesus and traveled with him and became fishers of men. Can we have a prayer? Dear God, at that time so far away, even coming to today, let us all be fishers of men, showing others the wonders of Christ in our lives. Amen. And I have a fish for you. And on the back, it has a verse. And it's the one that we read about today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, kids. You can go back to doing your thing. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper. Um, and now we continue to worship Almighty God by the giving of God's tithes and our offerings.
continue to offer our worship uh, through the singing of number six, 465, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you turn to the book of Acts? And I'm going to be reading from chapter 2 and starting at verse 41. We continue today in our series on congregational values called Fair Winds and Following Seas, a nautical image for the series that we have. Our first Sunday, the theme was All Hands on Deck, and it was about team ministry, how we come together to perform, not perform, to be obedient to God's calling on our lives. Last Sunday was Charting the Course, and it was how we value the Bible as a chart for our lives, uh, but also as a compass, something that shows us how to avoid the shoals of lives and, and directs our very hearts towards Jesus. Today, I'm going to be preaching about equipping for the journey. And we look at the, the very different things that God uses to, uh, to empower us. A little bit of backstory for Acts chapter 2 before I read it, though. Acts 2 is, I like to say, the birth narrative of the church. You had Jesus' 12 apostles, the ones who were with him for three years that he sent out. And then on the day of Pentecost, there were people from all over the known world who were there. And Peter started preaching this sermon uh, I would say a much more successful sermon than I will probably ever preach in that 3,000 people became Christians and were added to the church. And then after that, you have 3,000 baby Christians. <laughs> Whenever we have one new Christian, we like to say, uh, you need to be equipped for the journey. And so we encourage our young Christians, whatever physical age they may be, to get involved in discipleship, Bible study, Sunday school, small groups, prayer groups, um, coming to worship on Sunday morning. So this is what happens with all of these young Christians. And listen to all the things that they did and how all these things that they did were ways that God was equipping them as individuals and also as the community. That day, about 3,000 
took Peter at his word when he was preaching. And they were baptized, signed up for the church. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the life together, to the common meal, and to the prayer. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal was a celebration, exuberant and joyful, as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day, their number grew as God added those who were saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Jesus, who equips us, we come to you bare and unequipped. We realize that all the equipment we have in all sorts of ways, whether it is physical, whether it is learned, or whether it is the empowerment by you, it all comes from you. We praise God from whom all equipping flows. And so now, Jesus, we pray that you would Get our hearts ready to receive your word. And please, move me out of the way. For I, by myself, without you, am unequipped to speak. So please, equip us and speak to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In order to be equipped, a boat needs a lot of things. And I'm not going to go into everything that I've read about um, boats, but just a few general things, you know, um, just the boat as a whole has nothing, so it needs uh, a motor system if that's the type of boat it is, needs uh, a propeller, needs a rudder, needs a steering apparatus, needs onboard computers for navigation. Of course, a boat, in order to be equipped, needs someone who is able to pilot it and to, uh, any might need other um, mates on board to help the captain. And I was on a boat once that was a very small boat. It was a wakeboarding boat, actually. Any of you ever wakeboard or wake skate or uh, water ski? Well, this was my first time on one of these type of boats. And originally, I hadn't really planned to go out and to, to try my hand at wakeboarding. But lo and behold, a little bit into the trip, he said, Jason, you're up next. To which I replied non-verbally. My eyes got really big, thinking, oh goodness, uh, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready. But whenever it became my turn, I got all of the right equipment. Got the, the wakeboard under my feet, the um, fasteners for my feet to attach to it, a life vest, which was very crucial for me in that time. And uh, then there was the tow cable that I held on to. Um, my arms were outside of my knees, and as soon as the boat revved up, it started to pull me. But instead of pulling me up out of the water like I had been instructed to do, I sort of pulled through the water like an anchor. And instead of going up, I kind of went down. Water rushed over the top, under the bottom, into my face, nose, throat. And I let go, coughing and sputtering. Four times this happened, <laughs> and I kept trying. And then somebody came and said, Jason, how are you holding on? I said, well, it's my arms outside of my knees. And they said, no, 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 your arms need to be on the inside of your knees. So I put my arms on the inside as I was holding on to the tow cable, and the boat started off again, and sure enough, I got up on top of the water. Uh, my balance, though, leaves something to be desired, so I was not on top of the water for very long, before I fell down. The reason that I start with this is because I had all of the physical equipment that was needed as the pros used to go wakeboarding. I just didn't have equipment in between the ears. So there is something about equipment that 
is physical, but there's also something about it that is non-physical, that is acquired, that is learned. And I think that is the, the type that we read about, especially in the passage from Acts today. There were four different things that the new believers as individuals did. We read in the first verse here. It says, they committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Apostle meaning uh, the ones who were sent out from Jesus. Now, we commit ourselves also to the teaching of, of these apostles as contained in the New Testament, but there's also other people who God has sent out uh, that, w- that we learn from. Um, we call it discipleship. Uh, we are, are students of the Bible, students of what God is teaching us through the community. They committed themselves to the life together. Now, there were people from all over the known world. I find that even whenever there are people from all over the known county, sometimes things can be a little discordant because we all have such different understandings of the way things ought to go. But the people were all in harmony. It was something they were committed to. And as they came together to be discipled, as they came to be committed to life together, they were better equipped for the life that would happen with them together. They were committed to the common meal. We experience the common meal through communion on the first Sunday of every month. This is something that brings us together regardless of what place we come from, regardless of what our um, specific experiences were that week or how long we've been a Christian, we are reminded that we all are one. And this, this is something that equips us for the unknown because we're reminded that we're unified. They were committed also to their prayers. I am so blessed that this church as a whole is committed to prayer. A number of weeks ago, I was in my office and um, having a relatively rough morning, and then all of a sudden, like that, it was like joy rushed into my heart. I'm telling you exactly like it happened, and then I came out into the hallway a little while later, and the Monday morning prayer group came out and told me they'd been praying for me. We must be committed to prayer because even prayer is a way that equips us for life as Christians. The equipping of these young Christians was crucial because as we go on to read, shortly after they become Christians, a great persecution broke out that scattered them to all over the place. We may not have a great persecution, but there are things in life that necessitate our equipping, both as individuals, but also as a community. Some of the things that they did that this passage talks about, which are very important, are hospitality related. We usually don't think of hospitality as something that equips the church, but it was for them and is for us also. In their case, verse 45 says, they sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They held everything in common. I would not go ahead and advocate that all of you sell everything that you own, uh, but I think the principle that is here about equipping the community is that whenever they became part of the church, they held so tightly to Jesus and in the body of Christ that everything else that they owned, they were not holding on too tightly so that if some of it needed to go away to strengthen what God was doing, it was all right for that to happen. And so I say the same for us. That is one way that God can equip us But another aspect of equipping there is I think that whenever God gives us something that equips us as individuals, it's not just there for us to hang on to, but it's there for us to then equip other people. For example, Pastor Powell has uh, been not only um, the senior pastor here, but a mentoring pastor to me. And he has been equipped over a few decades of pastoral ministry, and just by doing his job, he is also equipping me. One great example of this type of 
ministry as equipping happened on Friday night. So some of you may know that my wife has been out of town at a conference in Minneapolis since Thursday. Well, uh, it's been very difficult for me uh, to function as a single parent in those days, which is why I offer up the prayer for anyone who is a single parent. It's very difficult. Uh, Worth has gotten up two out of the three mornings at 2.30 and been inconsolable. Uh, and so um, first morning, he got up and cried and cried until we were both in tears and I, I went and got him. But Friday night, I went to the fellowship hall to help. I used help loosely, help rewire everything. Rewiring is not one of my spiritual gifts or fortes. Uh, so I was pretty much just there offering moral support to the team And there were some people there who had been very well equipped as parents that came to my rescue. (laughs) And I don't think they really saw it as them coming to my rescue. They just thought, this is what we do as the church. Many people have come whenever I've been watching Worth, who today is 17 months old. Many people have come and picked him up. Even right now, uh, someone is walking around with him because He wasn't feeling so good and got kind of sick this morning. But them acting out of the place that God has equipped them, out of their spiritual gifting, has been equipping me. I would say that Pastor Powell is a baby whisperer. (laughs) All babies love you, Pastor Powell. But... You notice that the term is baby whisperer and not baby screamer. (laughs) I think that I started to move towards where I wanted to scream because I was so frustrated. But being around people who are equipped as baby whisperers has taught me to whisper. Kind of get the picture. Whatever God has equipped you for, just by acting out of that gifting, you are equipping other people, whether that is the gift of prayer, the gift of hospitality by sharing of your resources, or the gift of hospitality by inviting people over to share the common meal at your house, whether it's the the gift of teaching or encouraging, exhorting. Whatever your gift is, just by acting in it, God will strengthen it and strengthen the community around you. There's one other way of equipping So we've talked about the physical equipping that we have. And then we've talked about the type of equipping that comes through our um, spiritual disciplines, our our holy tempers, our, our attitudes that get changed as we become stronger Christians. There's a type of equipping, though, that comes directly from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus. The story that Mrs. Sutherland read shows that type of equipping. So Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, is preaching out of the edge of a boat, which is why this pulpit is kind of shaped the way it is, is in remembrance of that story where Jesus is right off the edge of the, the seashore and preaching to everybody. Jesus comes back from preaching and talks to all of these fishermen, the ones who would go on to help everybody into the church, those 3,000 in Acts. So these guys, this is the beginning of their call story. And Jesus says, go out and into the deep waters and, and catch some fish. They said, Jesus, we've been fishing all night long. If it was me fishing, that would have been since like 5 in the morning. <laughs> we've been fishing all night long and we've caught nothing. There's nothing out there, Jesus. But he said, but He he encourages them, and they end up going out there and casting their nets and end up pulling in so many fish that the boats start to sink. So they have to call more people over. Come on, we need help getting all these fish in. And they catch a multitude of fish that day. I like what, what the King James Version says about this. It has Jesus saying, cast out into the deep. It's kind of got this image in my head that Jesus sends the disciples out to the deep waters where where you can't exactly see what's under your boat. 
to the place that is over your head, maybe the place that's a bit uncomfortable, cast out into the deep. Jesus calls us to cast out into the deep as well. Here's an interesting part about this story that I thought about. The disciples, as fishermen, had every bit of equipment that they could need. They had the equipment of experience. This is what they did for a living, which is why they said, Jesus, we've been fishing all night long. They had the equipment of the boat and the net. Now, you know, sometimes we as churches, uh, and I just say churches, all of us human beings that are followers of Jesus. Sometimes we have all the equipping in the world. Sometimes uh, we have big buildings and lots of experiences. We have lots of holy tempers. We have good attitudes. We have all the gifts of the Spirit. We have all the education, but still have a hard time making new disciples and further equipping our church to grow. I have been equipped as, uh, as a preacher. I've had seven years of college. All of it was religion, philosophy, divinity school, everything. But I had an extremely hard time writing this sermon this week. Because even though we have different types of equipping, we still need the equipment of the Holy Spirit to tell us where to cast out into the deep. There's a beautiful example that is embodied in this church. How you all have been obedient to God's call to cast out into the deep waters. I've been told that some years ago, I don't know how many years ago, this church had uh, struggles with young people ministries, with children ministries or young adult ministries. This is the story of a, a lot of Methodist churches. But this church cast out into the deep. You built a building where the early learning center is now housed and there are dozens of children, my son included, who are ministered to and educated in that space. You have a ministry that allows the Boy Scouts to meet here. And last time I came on a Boy Scout night, there was not a parking space in the parking lot. I had to park on the grass. You have a ministry that is starting today with Family Promise where children, I think more children than adults are going to be coming in here. There's a ministry called Backpack Blessing where 62 children are now fed over the weekend. Oh, and by the way, the last Backpack Blessing that I was a part of, there were over 18 churches that came together and they didn't even have that many. You all have cast out into the deep and you have growing children's and youth ministries. There's now Elevate. The the youth group was multiplied into two different groups. Now it's Magnify and Amplify and I'm getting ready to start a young adult ministry. And no, it's not called Multiply. (laughs) It's going to be called Clarify. Lots of ministries. You all have been faithful to go where Jesus said, and now you're saying just like the disciples did, we need help. There's so many who are coming in that we need help to faithfully disciple them. People from all walks of life. Isn't that beautiful? And this is just one example of a ministry that God is growing because you who were equipped are going to equip and are being obedient to where Jesus is saying to go. The, um, the last verse in this Acts passage says, every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. So let us remember that. Though we have much equipping in the physical realm, though we have much education, much experience, though we have many spiritual gifts, Whenever it comes down to it, the equipping of people being brought in, of people being saved, is always an act of the Holy Spirit. So let us be attentive to where Jesus says go. And the Holy Spirit will be our equipment. Amen.
Our final hymn for today is Jesus Calls Us. So would you stand and sing 398, Jesus Calls Us. Following the benediction, we will sing our choral response. We just sang, give our hearts to thine obedience. So as God continues to equip us, may we then turn and equip others. As God equips this congregation, may it turn to call and equip the world as Jesus brings them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.